Good morning, God's beloved, and welcome to worship at Heart of the Rockies Christian Church Disciples of Christ. When we're able to gather in person, we do so on the northwest corner of LeMay and Trilby in Fort Collins, Colorado. Wherever you are joining us from this morning, know that we are so grateful that you're here and that we are bound together as the one body in Christ. Thanks, God. As we continue into the season of Epiphany, um, so too continues our Revelation sermon series. Revelation is a book that has so often been misused and misunderstood that sometimes we just kind of brush it aside altogether. But for six weeks at the beginning of this year, we're going to dig in and see what Revelation has to reveal to us for this time. A few things as you're preparing for worship this morning. If you haven't already, we invite you to gather the communion elements that you will use. Um, we say that all are welcome at our table because really it's Jesus' table and all means all. If you don't have a hard copy of a Bible handy, there's an app for that. And we encourage you to follow along as we read scripture this morning. We'll be in Revelation chapter three. If you miss our coloring sheets, not to fear, there is one every week in the worship email that we send out on Saturday. We also have a moment, especially for our children, that will come up right after we sing our first song together. We're so grateful that you're here because being together is what makes our worship pleasing to God. Is near. 
Today we are talking about how the author in the book of Revelation told the churches to not put anything else before God. I wonder why the author would be reminding the churches to not put anything before God. I wonder what sort of things we would put before God. I wonder if you can think of any other stories that you've heard where we've been told not to put anything before God. If you remember, almost at the very beginning of the Bible, in a story that we call the 10 best ways to live, we heard about Moses talking with God, and he learned about the 10 best ways to live. And one of them was about not putting anything before God. Hmm. I wonder if it's easy or if it's hard to not put anything before God. What do you think? I wonder why we would have a story at the very beginning of the Bible and at the very end of the Bible reminding us to not put anything before God. Let's pray. Holy One, thank you for this reminder to not put anything before you. even though it's very hard. Thank you that you love us even when we struggle with that. Bless each person who's listening today. Amen. We remember the model of leadership Jesus provided, coming not to be served, but to serve. We remember the unity God has given us, one body, one spirit, one hope of our calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God, creator of all. Today we have the privilege of saying both thank you and blessings as we honor those who have completed terms in leadership roles and we get to celebrate those who are either continuing their terms or who are stepping into terms for their roles. A word of thanks to all our leaders whose terms have been completed in 2020 and who are not renewing their term in the year ahead, including an elder, board members, and a steward. To Holly Sevett for her time as a steward. Holly, we've benefited from your skills in financial budgeting and management, and we've also benefited from your time as a youth leader. We already miss you and Micah, and of course, little Izzy. We hope you'll have a wonderful experience abroad and also hope you'll make it back to Colorado sometime soon. To Bill Stout, who has served as an elder of this congregation for three terms, 
Bill, you have a wonderful sense of Southern compassion and Western practicality. You've shown support for so many of us, and you've demonstrated in the example of your life and faith ways for people to find the support they need in God and in others. To Betsy Davis Nolan, who's been both my right and left hand for her terms as vice moderator of our church board. I can look around and see all the lives she's touched, leading the personnel team, the nominating process, and the team that founded the table at FOCO Cafe. Betsy, uh, you're the epitome of honesty and straightforward, clear thinking with, with gifts we will con continue to enjoy in so many ways. To Kyle Steffen, who like Betsy has numerous musical talents and also served on the board of our associate pastor search team. And most importantly, as part of our youth ministry team. Even when working all day or all night at his job, Kyle has faithfully served and participated in our church in many ways. We're grateful for all of you for the evenings, the weekends, the days you've shared with us to meet, to plan, to pray, to prepare God's kingdom, one act of leadership at a time. You model for us how we go about loving God, serving others, changing lives. We have an expression of our thanks um, that Stacy will soon be delivering to you. Um, this print from the SALT Project with the word hope. That's what your leadership has given us. We remember the church we are chosen to serve using the gifts with which we are equipped for the work of ministry, for the building up of the body of Christ. We remember the commission, the head of the church gave his followers to go into the world, witnessing, making disciples, baptizing, teaching, and serving, realizing that that charge is intended for all of us. As we prepare to recognize and commission our 2021 leaders, we remember that all of our leaders, past, present, and future, are not groups unto themselves. Each leader we commission today for the position in which they will serve this year is a link in the wider circle to which we all belong. Some among us are elders. Thank you, elders. Our elders are a group that who are gifted um, with the grasp of the gospel ex exemplified in word and deed. Our elders pray with us and for us. They celebrate and stand in sorrow with us. They have a vision of the church and its mission, and they are dedicated to expressing it in wise counsel, especially when we're facing complexity or conflict. As such, we anoint them today with the sign of the cross, that it might be a blessing upon their servant ministry of care and concern for the church as Christ's body and each one of us who are individually members of it. Some among us are board members. Our leadership helps our church fulfill God's mission in all our short-term and long-term plans. You serve as stewards of our congregation's vision and seek to build up the church in every way. One of us is our financial secretary who faithfully records gifts as they are given. Some of us lead ministry teams, property and outreach. They provide guidance and leadership in our various areas of ministry based on their passions for a particular expression of our shared ministry and mission. Some of us are stewards who are entrusted to manage our memorial and endowment funds, gifts given 
to expand the witness and mission of Jesus Christ in the world. Do each of you accept the office to which you have been called? And do you promise with God's help to fulfill its duties faithfully? If so, please say, I do. I do. I do. I do. I do. Thank you. Church, will you pledge your eager support of the work of God in this congregation alongside the leadership of all of these with whom you share ministry in this body of Christ? Will you pray God's blessing upon all of us as together we seek to support one another in selfless service? If so, please say, we do. You can say it out loud. We do. We do. <laughs> and church, you can put your we do in the comments too. We rejoice in this covenant of love that binds us to God and to one another. And we gratefully commission you to the ministries to which you've been called. Let us pray. Creating God, we rejoice that you have called us to be your people at this time and place. Help us to know what faithfulness requires of us. Strengthen our commitment and uphold your leaders with hope and encouragement. Fill this congregation with your loving spirit that we may work together for the common good and to your glory. We pray this in Christ's name. Amen. Each week, we pray for the prayers you've shared with us in the comments section. We ask that you share first names only, and then we'll pray for them in next week's worship. When I share a specific prayer, you can respond with, Lord, hear our prayer. Let's pray. We pray for our friend Jim, who is recovering from a heart attack. Lord, hear our prayer. We lift up Steve's mother, Louise, who has entered hospice. Lord, hear our prayer. We pray for Mary Beth, who recently received a new pacemaker. Lord, hear our prayer. We celebrate Daniel, who turned 14 last Sunday. Lord, hear our prayer. Holy One, in another week where our anxieties and fears run high, with nowhere to put our grief and trauma from almost a year of illness and death from COVID, when loneliness and sadness seem to have won, when we are at a loss of words at what our leaders are doing, we cry out, how long, O Lord? Will you hide your face from us forever? How long will we have sorrow in our hearts all day? Yet you remind us, just as you reminded the people of God in the desert, that you are with us. And like the people of God in exile, we confess to falling back on complaining when we do not know what to do. We want to go back to what we have known instead of going forward into the unknown. Yet we know that your ways are not your ways. We place everything above you. We put everything in the path and trip over it instead of listening for your knock on the door. The one that invites you in and reminds us to set the table for all. Open our eyes, God. Open our ears and our hands. Help us to be open to your spirit, the one who calls us to be kingdom come now. We are grateful. You are a God who hears all and forgets none. 
Hear our prayers, God, and hear us as we pray the prayer that Jesus taught us, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. I'm indebted to Cass Ponsolo for the powerful sermon she preached last Sunday to start off our Epiphany sermon series based on the book of Revelation. Now I have to confess, when I asked her if she would preach while I was on vacation, I maybe didn't mention that that's what the sermon series would be based on. But to her credit, when she found out, she didn't back down. And neither of us well, none of us could have imagined exactly how the events of the week leading up to it would have unfolded. And so thank you, Cass, for being you, for being courageous, for helping us hear the good news for today. Let's pray. May the words of my mouth and the meditation of each heart be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our rock, and our Redeemer. Amen. Several years ago when I was living in Southwest Missouri, I started to notice these stickers popping up everywhere. Mostly I would see them on the back window of a vehicle. Like any provocative branding, I guess, uh, I couldn't really understand what it meant. It was a very stylized version of what seemed to be the letters N-O-T-W. Not W? No T-W? Not what? I ask who I always do when I need a little bit more insight. Google. She replied, not of this world. Now, for those who are well-versed in John's gospel, you might recognize those words as an echo of John chapter 15. As it is, you do not belong to the world, but I have chosen you out of the world. But it turns out N-O-T-W is a Christian clothing company who uses this as their brand name, not of this world. Now, the armchair theologian in me wanted to probe that a little bit more. Not of this world. Eh, something catchy about it, to be sure. I don't know about you, but this world's kind of got me down these days. But I kept coming back to the preposition they used. 
not of this world. Well, we certainly live in this world, and we are loved by an incarnational God who chose to be in this world, at least for a time. Hey, Jesus. And as broken as this world is, I tend to believe that the realm of God isn't reserved only for those who have gone on to glory. Well, the kingdom of God is a reality that is continually emerging. Like we pray, thy kingdom come. And it's available to us all, here and now, on earth as it is in heaven. But John of Patmos, not to be confused with the beloved disciple of John's gospel, John of Patmos, a small island off the coast of Southwest Asia Minor, is credited with writing the wild book of Revelation, which contains a series of letters to the church. Now he rails hard against early Jesus followers getting too entwined in the culture and context around them. He sees it as dangerous. Now there's someone I want to introduce you to before we turn to our reading from Revelation today. Her name is Jezebel. That's not her real name. That's the name John of Potmos gives her. It's not a flattering one. In Revelation chapter 2, Jezebel is roundly rebuked for leading the people in her charge into adultery and leading them to worship false prophets. So why does Jezebel matter? Because in John's eyes, she is seen as being of this world. According to Warren Carter, she's an important church leader who John sees as advocating for the same cultural participation as the Balaamites and the Nicolaitans. In other words, he fears that she's teaching, wait for it, that cultural and civic participation might actually be a part of how we can be faithful to God's purposes. So that's Jezebel in a nutshell. And John? Well, John is preaching another way. We read from Revelation chapter 3, beginning in verse 14. And to the angel of the church in Laodicea write, the words of the Amen, the faithful and true witness, the origin of God's creation. I know your works. You are neither cold nor hot. I wish that you were either cold or hot. So, because you are lukewarm and neither cold nor hot, I am about to spit you out of my mouth. For you say, well, I'm rich, I have prospered, and I need nothing. You do not realize that you are wretched, pitiable, poor, blind, and naked. Therefore, I counsel you to buy from me gold refined by fire, so that you may be rich, and white robes to clothe you, and to keep the shame of your nakedness from being seen, and salve to anoint your eyes so that you may see. I reprove and discipline those whom I love. Be earnest, therefore, and repent. Listen. I am standing at the door knocking. If you hear my voice and open the door, I will come into you and eat with you and you with me. To the one who conquers, I will give a place with me on my throne, just as I myself conquered and sat down with my father on his throne. Let anyone who has an ear listen to what the Spirit is saying to the churches. The word of God for the people of God. And the people said, thanks be to God. Now, I happen to think Jezebel gets something right. We do live in this world. Although we may sometimes wish we were, we 
are not cloistered away from technology and politics and institutions and the economy. Neither was the church in Laodicea. In fact, John is scolding them for being too complacent, too willing to assimilate, to absorb the culture around them. He accuses them of being lukewarm, neither hot nor cold. Uh, consider that the closest water supply to Laodicea flowed over limestone cliffs, stunk like sulfur, and was generally warm and unpleasant. Well, I'd want to spit that out too. But it's more than a metaphor. It's an indictment of being unwilling to be uncomfortable. Uh, given the choice, I'm going to choose a lukewarm bath over one that is scalding hot or freezing cold. Martin Luther King Jr., whose life and legacy we remember and celebrate this weekend, famously wrote his letter from a Birmingham jail in 1963. It's often quoted still today. It's full of references from and allusions to scripture, as you might expect. After all, Reverend Dr. King was a preacher, first and foremost. In one of the lesser known passages in this letter, he writes about the perils of being lukewarm. For context, I'll read the full paragraph. First, I must confess that over the last few years, I have been gravely disappointed with the white moderate. I have almost reached the regrettable conclusion that the Negro's great stumbling block in the stride toward freedom is not the white citizen's counselor or the Ku Klux Klaner, but the white moderate who is more devoted to order than to justice, who prefers a negative peace, which is the absence of tension to a positive peace, which is the presence of justice, who constantly says, I agree with you in the goal you seek, but I can't agree with your methods of direct action. Who paternalistically feels he can set the timetable for another man's freedom. Who lives by the myth of time and who constantly advises the Negro to wait until a more convenient season. Shallow understanding from people of goodwill is more frustrating than absolute misunderstanding from people of ill will. Lukewarm acceptance is much more bewildering than outright rejection. Lukewarm acceptance is much more bewildering than outright rejection. And with regards to our faith, John might say it the same way Jesus did, although not in so many words. A lukewarm faith does not risk anything, and therefore it gains nothing. Listen, we might not be of this world, but there is no doubt we are in this world. And we get to choose how we show up in it. We do not have to be paralyzed by indifference or resigned to apathy. Jesus wasn't. So what in the world are we dealing with today? Gold and white robes and salve for our eyes might not be our antidote exactly. Today, in this world, capitalism is king. And we can choose to spend our dollars and invest our funds in ways that promote justice and equity. Today, in this world, and especially in our nation, white supremacy is the cradle that has held us since our birth. And we can choose to be actively anti-racist. Today, in this world, well, our corner of it anyway, we are bound by a representative democracy. And we can choose people who represent the values our faith instills. 
when our representatives are at their best anyway. John may have lived on an island in the sun, but we don't. I mean, maybe you do. I think this can be seen pretty much anywhere in the world at this point. We live in community. We live in a country. We live in an economy. We live within a set of cultural norms. Our faith cannot be entangled, unentangled from any of these things. And that may trip us up sometimes. It may also set us free because we don't have to wonder, when should I put my faith in action? Always. Where is God in all this mess? Everywhere. What separates us from the love of God? Nothing. What do we stand to lose? What do we stand to gain? Everything. Remember when we saw the boy washed up on the shore, the girl torn from her parents' arms. Remember when we heard 16 shots in the night, no justice for that life. We want to know where you know what you do. God, you seem so far away. We want to know where you were. We want to know where you are. We want to know what you do. God, you seem so far away. Remember when we saw the unloved daughter or son Abandoned and undone Remember when we watched The city burning down The sound of hate so loud We want to know where you were We want to know where you are We want to know what you you seem so far away. We want to know where you were. We want to know where you are. We want to know what you do. God, you seem so far away. Show us your love right now. Show us your grace right now. Show us your face right now. Show us your way. Remember when you cried, you were looking for us too. Told us love would see us through.
There are two Disciples of Christ churches on the Country Club Plaza in Kansas City. This is the way the story was told to me. It was the 50s or 60s, and one of these churches, in order to be able to come to the table to receive communion, uh, you had to be a member of the Christian Church Disciples of Christ. So there were a lot of people who, when they came to Kansas City, would go to the other Disciples of Christ congregation. They would become a member there because they didn't have to be rebaptized, and then they would transfer their Disciples of Christ membership to the other church on the plaza. This wasn't really any type of secret, or you might call it an open secret. One church was called Community Christian Church, and the other was called Country Club Christian Church. You might guess which is which. In good news, by the time I arrived in Kansas City in 2008, this was long, long in the past. Both churches at one point in time were very clear on where they stood and what they believed, and they made it clear to others. The good news is, even when we feel pretty darn clear in our convictions, in what we believe, there is the possibility that our minds and hearts will be changed. And so it is now. All are welcome at the table in both congregations as you are here, because this isn't the church's table. It's not my table. It's not your table. It's Jesus' table. And he says clearly and unequivocally, there is a place for you here. It was on a night of desertion and betrayal that Jesus was gathered at table with his disciples. He took the bread that was before them, he blessed it, he broke it, and he gave it to them saying, this is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, he took the cup after supper, saying, this is the cup of the new covenant. Do this as often as you drink it. In remembrance of me. I invite you to join me in a word of prayer over the elements that are before you today. Holy One, in the murky waters of life, we are grateful that you are so clear in the extravagant welcome that you extend to each and every one of us. We cling to your promise that the Apostle Paul writes that there is nothing in life or in death that can separate us from your love. And so we lean in to that love today, trusting that you are always and everywhere and that when we are ready to take the risk, to stand up, for what is right, to use our voice to speak truth, to stand firm for justice, that you are there with us too. Bless each element that is before us today, that for us, they might become not only a symbol of what is good and holy in this world, but that they might indeed strengthen us that we might be those vessels of your goodness and love. In the name of the Christ, we pray. Amen.
part of the Rockies, it is so easy to place something above God. It's easy to fill up our schedules. It's easy to place financial things above God. It's easy to put so much above God. And yet, even, or maybe especially, when there's a challenge, you continue to show up. You continue to share your gifts, your time, and your talent here at Heart of the Rockies. I've watched not just over the past year, but across the years when we've had challenges. I've watched as you have built gardens, you've built homes, you've showed up for people when they've had challenges. You continue to show up and I'm grateful. I would not be here if it were not for you. And I can guess that there are a lot of other people who can say that too. We may be apart physically, but we are not apart in so many other ways. The ways that you share keep us connected. And I'm so grateful. To give to Heart of the Rockies, you can go to heartoftherockies.org slash give or text the amount you'd like to give to the number on your screen. To keep connected to us, you can check out heartoftherockies.org slash COVID-19-updates. And we'd love to know that you were with us today to sign our online registry pad, or to share a confidential prayer request, become a member, or let us know that you'd like to be baptized, go to heartoftherockies.org slash connect. We are so grateful for you. to see We know that peace can feel in pretty short supply today. Maybe that makes it even more important that we take this time in our service 
to pass the peace to one another. Start with the person you're worshiping with. And you might send a text this week, write a handwritten note, make a call. Um, there is peace to be found in this world. May we be agents of it. A reminder that next Sunday we have a con excuse me, yes, next Sunday, January 24th, we have a congregational meeting at 11 a.m. Uh, that will be conducted via Zoom. You can call in if you need to. We will be um, voting on some amendments to our bylaws. Um, it's, our, it's our bylaws, in fact, that require us to review them every five years, which your church board faithfully has done. You should have all the information you need in your email. There will also be another motion brought forth regarding the next big thing. So again, check your inbox, and we hope you're able to join us on the 24th at 11 a.m. Our midweek meditation resumes this week from 8 to 8.15 on Wednesday morning. And we encourage you every week um, to open up the email that arrives on Monday morning that not only has links for all of our ministries throughout the week, but it also has a recap of Sunday morning worship um, and some other opportunities that we would love to have you be a part of. Would you join me in a good word for going? God. Be with us this week. We'll see you in other faces, hear you in other voices, love you in loving others, serve you in serving others, not conformed to this world, but transformed by your love.